In 1859, mathematician Bernhard Riemann published his one and only paper on number theory. This paper was called On the Number of Primes Less Than a Given Magnitude. It was in this paper that Riemann conjectured the now famous Riemann hypothesis. Specifically, he conjectured that the non-trivial complex zeros of an analytic continuation of a special function called the Riemann zeta function all have real part one half. My main goal in this video series is to present how the Riemann hypothesis relates to primes and a number of other interesting things. I'd like to begin by discussing the prime counting function, typically denoted with the Greek letter pi. This function gives you the number of primes below a given number. For example, evaluated at 10, the prime counting function equals 4, because there are 4 prime numbers below 10. You may be surprised to hear that there exist many known formulas for the prime counting function. For example, this expression here is equal to the prime counting function for any natural number x. The issue with a formula like this is that it doesn't give us much insight into the prime numbers. What we really want is a simple analytic expression, something we can write as a power series and something that doesn't use the floor function and hopefully not the factorial function. This is where Riemann comes in. In his 1859 paper, Riemann discovers an interesting way to express a function which not only counts primes, but also prime powers. This modified prime counting function is sometimes called a Riemann's prime counting function, which I'll denote with capital J of X. This function really considers weighted prime powers. What I mean by this is that for every prime power P to the K, the function increases by a value of 1 over k. So for example, at a prime number, the function increases by 1. At 25, the function increases by 1 over 2, because 25 is equal to a prime squared. At 8, the function increases by a value of 1 over 3, because 8 is equal to a prime to the power of 3. And you get the idea. In this equation for j of x, there's a sum which involves the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. From this expression, we can essentially see why the Riemann hypothesis is connected to prime numbers. The roots of the zeta function dictate the behavior of this sum in the expression for j of x, and j of x is a function that counts prime numbers and their powers up to x. But what we really want to know about is the prime counting function pi of x. It turns out, quite remarkably, that the true prime counting function, that is, the one which counts only primes, can be written in terms of Riemann's prime counting function, and something called the Mobius function. Pi of x is in fact equal to this sum. The Mobius function, mu of n, is equal to negative 1 to the power of k, if n has k distinct prime factors, and is equal to zero if n has a prime factor that appears more than once. Remember that by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, all natural numbers greater than one have a unique prime factorization. You may find this unsatisfying because of the presence of the Mobius function. We want the right-hand side of the equation to be completely independent of having to know anything about prime factorizations, because we want to understand the prime counting function with a formula that doesn't itself require knowledge of primes. But the Mobius function requires us to know about the prime factorization of n. Well, it turns out there's an incredibly simple formula for something called the Chebyshev function, which I'll denote as psi of x, which doesn't require any knowledge of prime numbers. Psi of x is equal to x minus log of 2 pi minus half of log of 1 minus x to the minus 2 minus this sum containing all roots of the Riemann zeta function. Psi of x is very similar to j of x, but instead of counting primes and prime powers, psi of x increases by a value of log p at any number of the form p to the k, where p is a prime number and k is a natural number.
Even though j of x has a formula which doesn't require us to know anything about prime numbers, the Chebyshev function psi of x has a formula which is even simpler. Before understanding where these expressions come from, we should start with the basic definition of the zeta function. The Riemann zeta function looks rather simple. It's defined as the infinite sum of the reciprocals of the natural numbers to the power of s. So we have 1 over 1 to the s, plus 1 over 2 to the s, plus 1 over 3 to the s, and so on. From this definition, it isn't hard to see that the zeta function diverges when s is a real number less than or equal to 0. And if you've seen a proof, you may know that zeta of s diverges even if s is less than or equal to 1. In fact, if we consider s to be a complex number and look at the entire complex plane, we can see that zeta of s diverges if s has real part less than or equal to 1. So using this definition of the Riemann zeta function, we can only plug in values of s from this region of the complex plane. If s is a complex number, we need to understand complex exponentiation. So just in case you forget how that works, I'll go over it now. Suppose we have a number n to the power of s, where s is a complex number. Now we can write this expression as e raised to the natural log of n to the power of s. In the next few steps, we can use basic logarithm and exponent properties to rewrite the expressions. Now you've probably noticed that there isn't any complex number that we can plug into this definition of the Riemann zeta function that will make this sum converge to zero. So a reasonable question to ask is what even are the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function? In order to answer that question, we need to first understand the analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function. Explaining that will take a bit of time, so we'll explore that in more depth in a later video. Now, let's assume we're totally unaware of the existence of any of the formulas we just talked about. Our goal is to somehow find out how the Riemann zeta function could be related to primes in any way. To begin, consider the zeta function multiplied by 1 over 2 to the s. If we distribute 1 over 2 to the s to every term in the infinite sum, we have 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 4 to the s plus 1 over 6 to the s, and so on. Each term in the sum now has, in its denominator, a multiple of 2 to the power of s. Now suppose we subtract this sum, 1 over 2 to the s times zeta of s, from zeta of s. We can write this as 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s, all times zeta of s. This of course subtracts off all terms from zeta of s, which are of the form of a multiple of 2 to the power of negative s. Now, let's multiply this sum by 1 over 3 to the s. What we end up with is an infinite sum containing terms only of the form of non-even multiples of 3 to the power of minus s. From here, we'll do the same thing as before and subtract this sum from the previous one. In other words, We'll remove all these terms containing non-even multiples of 3 from the sum 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s times zeta of s. We can write this as 1 minus 1 over 3 to the s, all times 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s, all times zeta of s. You may notice something special about these first few terms in this infinite series. It turns out, if we continue this procedure, of multiplying zeta of s by 1 minus 1 over a prime number to the power of s for every prime number, 
it becomes clear that the other side of the equation is equal to 1. Notice now that we can solve for zeta of s by dividing through by all the other factors on the left hand side. We can now see that the zeta function is equal to 1 over this infinite product containing all prime numbers. We can write this more compactly with product notation as 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s, where p runs over all the prime numbers. This infinite product is called an Euler product, and other series, similar to that of the Riemann zeta function, tend to have these Euler product expansions as well. This is a good place to stop for now. In the next episode, I plan to discuss something called the Jacobi theta function, a modular form of weight one half, which will be connected to the mathematics that we're going to look at. In the meantime, please feel free to ask any questions in the comments section, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video.